Marcy Shaw asks the vital question, what is worth dying for? While the world watched the uprising on the Maidan as an episode in geopolitics, those in Ukraine during the extraordinary winter of 2013 to 14 lived the revolution as an existential transformation. The blurring of night and day, the loss of a sense of time, the sudden disappearance of fear, the imperative to make choices. The Maidan was an illumination of the human capacity for natality, the ability to act, to begin anew at this moment. It was a turning point without which Ukrainian resistance to the full-scale Russia invasion cannot be understood. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the incredible guests that we feature, and please do comment as it does help to drive them up YouTube's algorithm, and it helps people to discover the channel as well. Our material is also available on popular podcast platforms. Please do consider help supporting the work of the channel through Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee. Before you do that, check out the validated Ukrainian charities in the description of the video. It's never been more important than it is now to support Ukraine to remain resilient. Marcy Shaw is an American professor of intellectual history at Yale University, where she specializes in the history of literary and political engagement with Marxism and phenomenology. Marcy is author of Caviar and Ashes, A Warsaw Generation's Life and Death in Marxism, and uh, The Taste of Ashes, a study in the presence of the communist and Nazi past in today's Eastern Europe. But today we will be discussing her most recent book about the revolution of dignity, the Ukrainian night and intimate history of revolution. Marcy, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Janet. Let's start. Well, I know you've been to Kiev, and I'd love to, to, to quiz you about that, because it is a pivotal moment in the history of Ukraine and independence. But let's go back to that moment in 1991, where, to an extent, the uh, the vote to, uh, to, to bring about Ukraine's independence, was that the sort of straw that broke the camel's back of the USSR? Good question. There were some history in in the Freudian sense is always overdetermined and that there are multiple factors, you know, playing themselves out simultaneously and you can't do a control study on real life. So many things were going on, the agitation for independence among the Baltic states, Gorbachev, perestroika, the economy, Reagan, there's no way to disentangle these different elements. Um, one thing I would remind viewers, I mean, a couple of things that I'm always telling students when I try to tell them this story. The first is just to appreciate and to be reminded that the Soviet Union Bolshevism was the largest, most deepest penetrating, grandest scale social engineering experiment ever performed on mankind. We are in many ways still grappling with the sheer enormity of the experiment the enormity of the attempt to remake not only government, but human beings, and the sheer enormity of the failure. And it seemed inconceivable that it was going to fall apart until the moment that it did. There's that book by um, the anthropologist Alexa Yurchuk called Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. So I would also re I would remind viewers of just the sheer scale and the inconceivability of the Soviet Union breaking up until the moment it did. You know, and then everybody was a bit dazed and multiple things were happening at once, you know, and in all the there were 15 republics, they were all kind of breaking up, you know, in various ways, with various degrees of enthusiasm or agitation. Um, what was clear was that the referendum in Ukraine showed that all across the board in all different regions of Ukraine, people voted in favor of independence. Now, what that meant, how exactly to what that was a response, was it a response to the, the desire for the end of communism, for the desire of the end of Sovietness, for the desire to separate from Russia and Russians and a Russian imperialist legacy? Was it a desire for a fresh start in a more amorphous way? Was it, that's impossible to disentangle. All of those factors were playing themselves out simultaneously. And if we look, uh, and this is um, this is real weakness, isn't it? Because when you talk about Ukraine, I've been to so many events where people just ask questions about Russia. But if we compare the 
rate of change and the type of change. Russia seems to be like that sort of uh, tectonic plates. You think nothing's happening and then suddenly there's this huge seismic catastrophic shift. Whereas Ukraine has had multiple revolutions, multiple leaders. Do you think this is one of the fundamental differences uh, between the two societies? One has these incremental revolutions. The other one resists change until change overwhelms the system. Well, I wouldn't essentialize as a matter of character, but we can describe the history of the past 30 years, which played itself out in very different ways. You know, one thing I would emphasize is that Ukraine today is a very different country from what Ukraine was in 1991. I'm quite skeptical about these arguments that look back to 988 or look back to the 17th century or say that, you know, there have been ethnic Ukrainians drinking in freedom with their mother's milk since time immemorial. Whereas we're, um, I'm, I'm generally skeptical about those kinds of arguments. I mean, history is very contingent in all sorts of ways. But what we can say is that this is a society that has changed enormously in the past 30 years and has grown enormously. And I have anecdotal observations. I have a historian's observations about this, but I would also say that there's a there's a very good book that just came out by my, my sociologist and political scientist colleagues, um, Olga, Olga Onuch and Henry Hale, based on large scale survey research done by Ukrainian as well as non-Ukrainian social scientists who actually work with numbers. I'm an intellectual historian. I don't work with numbers. I don't do regression analysis. I don't have statistics for you. Um, but Olya and Henry and, and Volodymyr Kulik and the other people on this team actually measured certain things. And the the upshot of all of those very sophisticated statistics is that attitudes towards corruption, towards democracy, towards civil engagement, towards the role of civil society, towards civic duty have changed tremendously over 30 years and tremendously over 10 years. You know, and one of the things I like about that, or one of the reasons I think that book is so important you know, is that it's a story about, it's it's a non-essentializing story. It's just a story that says societies can change. People can grow. You know, new generations can have different attitudes. People can make decisions about how to make the world a better place. That is possible. And because that's possible, that's a source of hope for all of us. The question then becomes like, why did these changes happen in Ukraine and not in Russia? And how contingent was that Again, I'm very skeptical about the essentializing. We'll put away, I'll put aside anything having to do with blood, with race, with genetics. Um, there's been a lot of talk about intergenerational trauma not being worked through, things not being spoken about. Um, there's been a lot of talk about should we have, should the West have helped Russia more in the 1990s? Were we too complacent? Did we all buy into the Fukuyama-esque end of history narrative where, okay, things are rough, but they're just bumps in the road as we all proceed inexorably towards liberal democracy. Of course, that will happen in Russia as well. They'll work their way there. And we didn't fully appreciate just how traumatic the 1990s were in Russia, how vulnerable it left that population. Um, and then there's the elements of chance. There's the elements about how people come to power, about being in a certain place in a certain time, and the elements of what is sometimes called, you know, salami tactics. You know, Putin very, very gradually kind of moving from what seemed like a rough grappling with corruption, but moving towards democracy system into a neo-totalitarianism. And it didn't happen overnight. It happened slowly. And whether you use the analogy of the frog boiling in water or whether you use the analogy of the salami tactics, when things are gradual, we often don't notice them until suddenly it's ostentatious and, and in our face and we're struck with horror. This idea is initially one of the inevitability of democracy, the inevitability of liberal values, etc., which seemed natural perhaps in the 90s. Um, now they seem anything but, they seem fragile. And I think anyone who has spoken to people who were involved in Maidan, you get a sense that democracy is neither easy, nor is it natural, nor does it just happen accidentally. It seems to require a great many people to have 
a whole will to take mm -hmm. part and individual revolutions. It's, it's not just a process, yeah. it's change within individuals. You've been a very close observer of that. How important is it that we actually collate these stories and understand that this is complex, multi-layered, and uh, requires individuals to take huge risks? Well, I'm a historian, and so I, I tell stories about people. So from my point of view, the only way to really convey knowledge, the only way to really understand is to go back to empirical stories about real live empirical people. You know, anything else is an abstra abstraction. Anything that is not about real people in a real time in a real place is an abstraction. So even though I'm an intellectual historian and I like to write about philosophy and I like to write about ideas, I'm always going back to narrating stories about real people. I think that's our only possibility for understanding one another. I mean, the remarkable thing about the Maidan was you, I mean, you have individuals making choices and how do you get revolution? You get revolution where you have a critical mass of individuals making certain kinds of choices at the same time, you know, and how that happens at the same time, you know, that's, that's the miracle of revolution. You know, that's the answer we don't quite have. A, a colleague of, a Ukrainian colleague of mine, um, when I saw him a year or so ago, you know, I said, what would it, you know, what would it take? You know, what would it take to bring down Putin's regime in Russia? He said, two million people in the streets of Moscow, it's over tomorrow. And I said, Vlad, how do you know it's two million? Like, would 1.9 million not be enough? When is it that one additional person? They're always individuals, but when do you get them coming together? The miracle of the Maidan was a moment of coming together, and it was a collection of individual choices. And there was an extraordinary self-consciousness about that. They used two analogies. One was the pixel analogy, we're all a pixel, you know, and the drop in the ocean, you know, analogy. But it was everyone making those decisions that I want to be a pixel in this picture. I want to be a drop in this particular ocean. That's, it's a, that's an extraordinary process. I mean, I, I listened to Andrei Korkov last week, and mm -hmm. I think this is an idea that might be uh, perhaps a little sort of simple to explain the complexity you're describing. But he said that, Broadly speaking, Ukrainians, if you have the choice between stability and freedom, they'll tolerate a certain mm. level of chaos and instability. Freedom is the thing that you do not relinquish for anything else, for a fridge full of sausages and cheese, for instance. Mm. Whereas, he said, broadly speaking, um, Russians will sacrifice an awful lot for this idea of stability. I think he perhaps labeled it as, as mythic as well, because mm. as we see now, um, there is no such thing as an eternal stability that you can sacrifice mm. your freedom for. Do you think this is a helpful idea? I think it's certainly a very resonant description of the situation at the moment. Now, how that came about and how those societies came about valuing these things at this particular moment is, is a different question. Um, I've always been interested in this question of generations. I've always thought in many ways, historians are always looking for a category that helps us mediate between the singular and the universal. Philosophers like to go right from the singular to the universal. You know, Hegel is all about how do you connect the particular and the general. But historians like to look at, they like to look at class, they like to look at religion, they like to look at nation as some kind of mediating category. And I've always liked to look at generation because you get, it, it's such a robust moment of change and values seem so particularly coalesced among you know, looking at the age you were when certain things happen. So I think that's certainly true now. One thing we really did not appreciate enough about Russia was just how radical the inst terrifying the instability was in the 90s that led people to seek stability and how Putin was able to exploit that. I mean, I, I remember being in Moscow for the first time in, in 1993, and it was terrifying. I mean, there was a sense that anything could happen at any moment, that nobody was accountable, that it was a wild free for all, that whatever kind of freedom had come and whatever that meant, it basically meant that anyone could slit your throat at any moment. I and mean, there was really a sense of there being no, no grounding and no security at all. So there's, 
there's just how radical that situation is and what kind of insecurity are you willing to tolerate? You know, financial insecurity, well, how radical is the financial insecurity? There's financial insecurity that's about like, I won't be able to buy my own apartment. I'll have to rent this studio. And there's the, my children will starve to death. Those are different kinds of financial insecurity. Um, but definitely Putin was feeding off this desire for stability which people were willing to trade a lot for. And the great, the holy grail in some sense of political philosophy has been, can you find a way to maximize freedom and security simultaneously? You know, and Hobbes in his very radical way says, no, this is a zero sum game. Um, and that was particularly draconian. You know, people like Lesha Kolkowski and Isaiah Berlin have said in more gentle ways, the fact is that not all good things go together that some good things exclude other good things. There's no way to maximize both freedom and security and mercy and justice and all of these things at the same time. There's always some give and take. And, and they're definitely, I mean, here at the moment, the radicalism of that distinction is laid bare because you have so many Ukrainians, you have a whole country saying, we are willing you know, to give up all security at the moment you know, to die for freedom. And that's an extraordinary moment. It's a terrifying moment. And it's also an enormously moving moment. I felt like it was a privilege just to be there. Another interesting process in in, in the 90s, and you know, I echo that my, my, my first time uh, in Russia was 1992. Staying for a couple of months in MGU. And yes, it was, it was, it was very odd. Um, but you got the impression at that time that people were discovering. Because, of course, family histories, as well as political and societal history, had been very much suppressed. And people were afraid, often, of even passing across their own family history. Um, you know, the legacy of the 1930s really lived on deeply in, in, in a whole generation. So you have people discovering foreign literature, their own suppressed literature, mm -hmm. and their own family histories. That, I imagine, is a process that, that happened in Ukraine as much as it did uh, in Russia. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I get the impression that many Russians decided, well, that's well, we've done that. That's quite enough of that. It's 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 painful and unpleasant. And what Putin's done is he's enabled people to forget. He's said it's okay to be amnesiac. It's okay mm -hmm. to, you know, adopt these ideas of nationalism, so on, because they will absolve you of these horrible things that were done in the past and so on. Um, whereas Ukrainians seem to continuously examine and re-examine and seem to have, I would say, bravery in, in, in really sort of, you know, discussing, exploring the traumas of the past and even learning the lessons of those. Whereas in Russia, uh, people, people are once more, you know, burying the horrors of the past. I should first of all say I'm very biased because I work with students in Ukraine. I'm a historian and I work with students in Ukraine. Some of them are my students per se. Some of them are the students and graduate students of my friends and colleagues there. Once you have students, you're always sending your students to consult with other people as well. You know, And I've seen this generation coming up being so much more fearless. And I'm so proud of them because I also have this kind of Jewish mother feeling about all of these people who are my students, the ways in which they're willing to face the past with eyes wide open. And again, I'm biased because I'm a historian and historians think understanding the past is important, you know, and if it weren't important, then we wouldn't have a reason for existence. So there's a bit of self-interest in my taking this particular line. Um, but they've done tremendous work. People are constantly saying, you know, you're a Jew. My Bubby would turn in her grave if she saw a Jew advocating for Ukraine. And, and my great grandparents were pogrom victims in Ukraine. You know, I'm very aware of very dark history of Ukrainian Jewish relations. And I feel very strongly that Ukrainians today need to be judged not on what people did before they were born, you know, who happened to be, you know, ancestrally connected to them, but on how they're facing that past in the present. Um, and that this, by the way, I think is the key insight in some ways that Memorial in Russia had. Like that they had this intuition that facing the past with eyes wide open, the crimes that were committed to the past was intimately bound up with human rights in the present. Yeah. And 
Well, one of the things that Arkady Ostrolsky says in this phenomenal podcast series um, next year in Moscow, he does. Arkady is the Russian correspondent for The Economist. Um, he's covered Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. He's based in Britain. you know. And he said it wasn't February 24th. It was December. It was the end of December 2021 when Putin shut down Memorial. I knew. I knew we were, I knew catastrophe was coming. Like it was the shutting down of Memorial that I we had crossed the line. Now the catastrophe was going to come. And that was a very telling insight, you know, because what you would think what Memorial is doing, the crimes that they're primarily investigating, the things that people like Yuri Dmitriev, who's now been in prison since 2016, were doing, these were crimes committed primarily during Stalinism. These were people who were executed, you know, in forest in the 1930s, which is to say that nobody who committed those crimes is for the most part alive now. So it's not that people are under threat. It's not that Putin and his cronies are personally under threat for being implicated because these things happen too far in the past. The people who actually had that blood on their hands, they're all basically long dead. So why is it so threatening? You know, And that insight that unless we look at that past with eyes wide open, we have no chance you know, of coming into a respect for human rights and human dignity in the present. That was at the crux of Memorial, and I think they were right. And, and writers like Sergei Lebedev um, and Maria Stepanova and many of like the best Russian writers have said, this is it's the failure to face the past. It's the failure for Russians to confront the crimes of Stalinism, in which they were both implicated and they were the victims. You know, that has somehow made people impotent in the present and there's so many so many questions that sort of spring from from there i got the impression as well and there were tremors weren't there in 2021 that something big was on the way and i one of the one of the triggers for me was seeing Viktor Shinderovich handed out of the country. Mm. And I thought, the minute a regime can't tolerate satire and satirists, mm. that's the point at which you know there's going to be no, no voice uh, allowed. I should have... I'm a neurotic catastrophist. So it wasn't that I thought everything was going well. But even for me, even for a neurotic catastrophist like myself, February 24th was a shock. There's a, a yeah, fantastic Polish journalist, Pavel Pinyanczyk, who wrote this book called Odpor Resistance about the beginnings of, of the full scale invasion and the mobilization of Ukrainian civil society. And he makes this distinction between surprise and shock. It's not that it was a surprise. Everybody knew, everybody was watching, people were paying attention. But something that's not a surprise, even somebody like me who's following and noting the signs, was still, I was still in a state of shock. I still couldn't quite take in that that it had come to that. Yes, the return of history, um, unfortunately. Let's turn back to Maidan, because I think this is an interesting process. I mean, Russian soft power, Russian propaganda wasn't properly tackled even after 2014. Um, and it still had quite some influence but at the same time what Sasha Dozhik has called is is sort of Maidan values again that didn't percolate throughout the whole of society immediately mm -hmm. but as Olga Onuk has uh, pointed out there is a uh, waves of propagation and dissemination uh, from from west to east I and mean, it's not as simple as that but certainly Maidan seems to sort of percolate through society not all at once but in a kind of process, a gradual process. What are the key drivers, do you think, um, of that revolution and the ripples of it continuing through um, right up until the full-scale invasion? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting that you use the word percolate because I'm always telling my students that I, these ideas are like good coffee. They have to percolate. They have to kind of be there percolating for a while. They don't, it's not like they're, the idea is there and then there's an immediate effect. You have to watch it percolate. And I think that's definitely, that's definitely the right idea. I mean, one thing that happens is that a generation, there's a generational turn. 
You know, so I see that a lot of the people who are playing key roles now in the resistance, you know, in the preparations for reconstruction, in intelligence, in strategy, you know, people who were 21, 22 on the Maidan, and now they're 31, 32, you know, and now like their generation has come of age. I mean, so that's that's huge. You know, the, the fact the generational change is huge. Um, Olya Olnuk and, and Henry Kell have also written about that. I think Olya calls it the independence generation, people who were formed. And this is also a very interesting historical trope because it's the Moses metaphor that you have to wait 40 years for the generation of slaves to die out in the desert so that people uncontaminated um, will come of age. Václav Havel believed that to the day he died. He said, you have to wait for a generation completely unformed by communism to come of age before you can have new values. So I think that was definitely the case. Um, I think there was a real determination that what happened after 2004 was not going to happen after 2014. You know, the Orange Revolution, when people went out onto the streets to demand fair elections, you know, and Yushchenko, the elections were done over, you know, and then Victor Yushchenko was declared the winner. Everybody was very happy. They went home and it was like, OK, we got rid of the bad guy. Now we have the good guy. Now we're going to live all happily ever after. I mean, I was in I was in Kiev doing art, not for political. I was in, I, I, in Kiev doing archival research in the summer of 2005. So maybe six months after the Orange Revolution. And there was such an optimistic mood. There was a like, now we've got the good guys in power. Now it's all going to be OK. And when that fell apart, there was really a kind of collective self-criticism of Okay, we you know no more waiting for the Messiah figure, no more trying to get the good Tsar in. There's no one else. It's ourselves. It's got to come from the bottom up. It's got to be grassroots. We've got to build our own society. In that sense, the Maidan was much more mature. There was a much deeper sense of responsibility. And I think that did really, really percolate outward. I think there was, I mean, I, I can't speak to this scientifically, but you know, the areas that came under Russian occupation in, in the East and in the Donbass were such catastrophes that I think that information percolated out too. I mean, the Isolatia, you know, which you know, Stanislav Aseyev writes about in his book about being tortured for two years in this prison camp in Donetsk was so horrifying. And that information did percolate out that there was a sense of, okay, maybe it wasn't just all the same if these areas were Russian or Ukrainian or came under separatist control. I think that also shook people, you know, in a way that because those those places had turned into such dysfunctional reigns of terror. And of course, you know, if you go back to the so-called hybrid war, and I know not everyone sort of likes that term, um, Russia still had some leverage through soft power, hybrid coercion, as well as military force. Um, so the uh, impetus to switch from Russian to Ukrainian, if you're a native Russian speaker, for some people, that only came about during the full-scale uh, invasion. Um, and I would say for some, the, the pain of speaking Russian it wasn't as painful yet. And of course, lots of people have, have, have dropped that. Um, Russia, to an extent, has burned its soft power, hasn't it? Um, and yet it continues in the West. That still is a tool that it's able to exert in the West. But what's the implication for Ukraine of Russia really sort of, I would say, sort of burning all the goodwill, burning up whatever value is invested in its history, literature, and so on, do you get the impression that, that is now done for a generation or more? I think it's done for a generation. I find it wrenching and, and heartbreaking. You know, I'm probably more attached to Russian than you know most of my Ukrainian friends. But they, the irony and the perversity by which they destroyed themselves and which families broke up. There were all these divided families, and that had been a very soft border. There were many, it was complete, it was to be, to be living in Kiev and decide to study in Moscow or vice versa. It was like someone from Philadelphia deciding to study in Toronto or, you know, I did my MA in Toronto. I mean, it was that kind of a border, you know, and so there were, it was completely normal for that to be very fluid, you know, for I, my Russian friends were spending vacations with their cousins, you know, in Ukrainian villages. There was, 
uh, Russian language, Russophone literature was flourishing. You know, Andrei Korkov was writing in Russian. Volodymyr Rafayenko was writing in Russian. He still does. Um, Iakiva it's... was writing in Russian. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. nothing. With, everything was fine. There was no reason to do that. I mean, there was the perversity. Everyone, all of these Russians talking about how they're so nostalgic for the vacations in Crimea and the Soviet era, and that was their childhood, and you were on the beach, and you read Chekhov, and nobody was stopping anyone from going on vacation in Crimea. You know, right, Russian friends were still going on vacation in Crimea. It was barely a border at all. And I mean, if there hadn't been this pervert, vacation is supposed to be you pack your bathing suit and some good novels, and then you get to jog on the sand and sip cocktails on the beach. And suddenly it was like, oh, we loved going to this place for vacation. We're going to pack our camouflage and Kalashnikovs and stage a violent invasion. Well, now you've ruined Crimea for everybody. I mean, now you've turned it into a war zone. That's just pure perversity. It's pure nihilism. There was no reason to do that. You know, Russians were perfectly free to go on vacation in Crimea. Like the, the, the nihilism of it, you just... You know, this, oh, you have this emotional attachment to, to Mariupol, this beautiful seaport city. Well, we'll just raise it to the ground. So it's rubble, you know, and we've just massacred all of these innocent people. It's it's like Dostoevsky and, you know, out of BSD, out of the demons level nihilism. Nobody wins. You know, you, you just destroy things. It's like destruction for the sake of destruction. I think uh, that that's a crucial phrase there. There's no concept of a win-win culture uh, oh, to take a sort of mm. business terminology um you mentioned a really interesting thing which is generational change and i think you know whenever i mention maidan to ukrainians they gently point out that it wasn't the first revolution there were orange revolution revolution on mm. granite and indeed the independence vote was a form of revolution itself um but it's an interesting process because in maidan as you say you've got second generation revolutionaries people who have brought up during independence and they're transitioning uh, to a new generation who are building a new society and a new state. What I think is, is less observed is that there's also a transference, a generational transference in Russia taking place. But, and I think there's some interesting stats that I saw, that around 60% of the influential positions in culture and so on are very much inherited from the previous regime and that includes security apparatus and so on yeah. so you've got a generational change but it's an inherited generational change yeah. passing on wealth status and power and it's a point of extraordinary risk um and it's an incredible contrast isn't it seeing that and i can't help feeling that putin's behavior now is as a result of that impending generational risk uh, of passing over status and power. And the fact he hasn't appointed a successor, as far as we know, and there's no real mechanism or process to, to do that. And that includes the oligarchs and all their ill-gotten gains and influence. I look every day at what's going on in the Kremlin and think, how did we get to this situation? How do we have this madman? You know, how do we have someone who is willing to destroy the world for his own irrational, narcissistic reasons? How do you have conquest just for the desire for conquest? Why has there been no generational change? How much was inherited from from the legacy of the KGB. There have been all sorts of you know, people like like Masha Gessen and, and Julia Yofi have done very good work on Putin and said, well, his parents you know, survived the siege of Leningrad. That kind of trauma gets passed on generation to generation, you know, that he was traumatized by being in Germany when the wall was coming down and Moscow was not answering the phone and that sense of could this grand project have abandoned us? He was formed by the KGB. That's his only that's his only real understanding of how you work the world is through provocation and through manipulation and through spying for all of those undetermined reasons. I mean, one of the things I do find really interesting about that, in that some sense, the failure of generational change um, and real cultural shift in Russia is what we're talking about really for the first time now is intergenerational trauma which I think, you know, this is you know, this is for psychologists and psychoanalysts and you know, people who are much more trained in it than I am to look at. But I think there really is something to the, you know, all of these horrible things that happened that were not processed, 
that were not spoken about. My my um, friend and colleague, um, Anna Shortchudovnovskaya in, in Vienna, who was my generation raised in Soviet Kiev, but has really had her whole academic career in the German speaking world. She speaks about something called a, a threshold of sensitivity um, and that how Putin has systematically, his regime has systematically cultivated, you know, a very, a, like a very low sensitivity to violence. You know, so that through popular culture and through politics and through assassinations, there's an extraordinarily high tolerance for brutality, you know, and how does that come about? You know, one of the things that came out early in, well, there, there are two things I would mention here, one of which is I think the Belarusian feminists were really onto something when they spoke in 2020 about how a language that these feminist groups in Belarus had developed over years to articulate the problem of domestic violence, which like in all sorts of other societies was very widespread and there hadn't really been a language to talk about it. You know, and um, my, my friend Olga Sparago was saying, you know, this language that we developed to talk about something that in some ways was very personal and very private and going on in marriages and in romantic relationships and in families became a language that all of us, men and women alike, could use to articulate how they were being treated by a tyrannical regime. And this domestic violence as, as a metaphor, but not only a metaphor, you know, I think they were really on to something that was key. I mean, one of the things that chilled me very early after the full scale invasion of the many horrible things that came up and were passed around on social media was a phone call that was intercepted by Ukrainian intelligence of a 20 year old Russian soldier describing to his 40 year old mother graphically these torture techniques they were using on captured Ukrainians. Um, and the first thing that's very was very disturbing was there was almost something kind of quasi sexual and incestuous about how these torture methods were being described. But then about five minutes into this conversation, the 20 year old Russian soldier says, yeah, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to try some of these out on dad? You know, and not knowing anything else about this family, you already know there's a deep history of domestic violence in this family. You know, a forensic psychiatrist could have themselves a whole dissertation based on that eight minute phone conversation. You know, and I think that kind of violence, you know, that those, the generations that went through Nazism, that went through Stalinism, to have survived Stalinism was to have participated in it, to have been implicated in it, to be guilty of it, and also have to have been victimized by it, and probably victimized by Nazism as well. All of that unprocessed, the unprocessed violence, the unprocessed kind of sadomasochistic elements there, the brutality, the humiliation, you know, I think that is key. And that intergenerational transmission of it and something that has not been, there hasn't been a moment of, okay, we have to kind of take stock and decide where we want to go. And that has not happened. Something has gone very wrong. And of course, an idea that's been sort of propagated through many Ukrainians I've spoken to is the idea that having political agency can be an extraordinary um, way to go beyond this trauma, to examine it and, and outgrow the trauma. And of course, the Russian system does not encourage mm -hmm. political agency at any level. So on some levels, there's an infantilization of the entire population um, and a discouragement to to organize and express political agency. That's I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, and I think the real crisis in Russia is a crisis of subjectivity. You know, and many people, you know, have written about how what Putin's really good at is not mobilizing the population, but demobilizing. You know, what he's really good at is not like making them into a hate mob, but making them feel like they couldn't possibly do anything else other than what he says. You know, and that. That has to be the key to what's going on. I mean, I can just tell you a couple anecdotes about that. I was, my my kids were, my, my son was interviewing at high school um, a few weeks ago and I was sitting in the waiting room and there was another mother there my age sitting in the waiting room who his son was also interviewing and we started chatting. And I heard that she had a very slight Russian accent, so slight that she must have come decades ago. And had I not been a Slavicist, I would not have noticed it. Um, and in... In pre-2022 days, I would have 
brought it up and started talking to her about that. But I would now never call anyone out as being Russian, given the current situation. But we got into this conversation about how these different schools we were thinking about for our kids, big schools, small schools. And one of the I said, you know, all of these schools are just so much nicer than the schools that I went to in the 1980s. You know, and it's it's fantastic for me that my kids have a chance to have a very different kind of con very different kind of education. And she said, Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Like the schools I went to were horrible. And I said, Well, where where did you go to school? And she said, I went to school in Moscow. And once she admitted to having gone to school in Moscow, I then asked her if she would tell me the story in Russia. And then she switched to Russia. And she said, Well, in the morning, the teacher would come in every single day and start off the day by saying, Dobre utro idioti. You know, good morning, idiots. Like, you know, and that was the tone in which we always started off. And I thought, okay, like there's, that's actually a very revealing anecdote. You know, if every morning, you know, you go into school and you hear that you are good for nothing, that you are idiots, that you have no ability to think on a like, okay, an individual here or there might break out of that and rebel, but on the scale of millions, you know, that's not going to be a very empowering situation. Yeah, my daragi pridurki kind of, uh, yeah. you know. um, and the last question really, and I'll, I'll just share another story from the channel. I mean, I did ask a former uh, colonel of the, I think it was the third director of the KGB, now a defector in Canada, mm -hmm. um, what made Putin behave as he did, and he said it's very very simple. He's short and he's skinny, and that explains <laughs> everything. Um, <laughs> But if we look forward, I mean, these are very critical times for Ukraine. Um, they are not just defending their country, their language, their identity. They're defending the revolution that has had a tr transformative effect on society. Do you still remain optimistic that the Ukrainian horizontal will beat the Russian vertical? Yes. Yes. Despite everything, I remain optimistic. And despite the fact that I, that's a very interesting comment that your KGB guy said, because looking at, and again, I'm biased, I'm a woman, I'm not a man, but looking at Trump, looking at Lu Lu Lukashenko, looking at Putin, I thought, my God, these insecurities about masculinity are destroying the world. You know, these seem like three men with issues about masculinity, and they're going to take it out by abusing other people. You know, and one of the things the Belarusian feminists were saying, okay, we need to move from, you know, a vertical model in which strength is associated with, you know, abuse, you know, and violence and who you can crush. And we need to move to a horizontal model in which strength is associated with taking responsibility for one another and caring about one another. And I do looking at, I mean, being in Kiev this week, which was extraordinary, you know, and looking at the resilience of the population and the determination, nobody was willing to give up, even being night after night in the bomb shelter, you know, even looking at the news every two minutes and tearing their hair out and mourning for their friends and mourning for these kids being buried under rubble. Nobody was ready to give up because they understood that you're just get, that it's a reign of terror that no negotiation with the reign of terror would be possible. I mean, it was like saying, well, could we leave some percentage of the Jewish population in Europe under Nazi rule? You know, could 1945 have gone another way? But also seeing how determined they are, you know, to create a different kind of society, you know, to think about reconstruction in a way that we're not just going to go back to what had been, we're going to build something better. We're going to mobilize this kind of solidarity, this kind of cooperation, this kind of selflessness, which is, you know, historically there are that kind of solidarity historically comes up for a flicker of a second for an algenblick, and then it's over. But is there a way to institutionalize it? Is there something we can do? And having... Now, having come back, and I realize I'm extra emotional because I just left and I have these fresh impressions, I, I really am optimistic. I mean, I think I like I, I brought children into the world, so I have to believe that in the long term, tyranny is not going to win. What a great place to end and what a positive uh, thought as well, an empowering thought, which uh, I, I agree with as well. Hopefully our democracies can be renewed by the Ukrainian experiment and the Ukrainian experience as well. Marcy, it's been a huge pleasure. I highly recommend people read your book to really understand the sort of roots of this struggle and why Ukrainians will never give in. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Jonathan.